I think we're still on track. Yeah, I sort of got a preemptive on this pulpit present. Where'd the one go I'm supposed to give away? Okay. I have Rice Krispie treats. And for the kids who are going with Lisa, you have Rice Krispie treats too. Not my Rice Krispie treats. You have your own Rice Krispie treats. Go on, let's go, get it. Y'all are so used to going that way. I know you're going this way. Hello? Oh, no. I can't Who knew? Who knew? I think we're still in the track. Are we in preaching? It's all in the monitor. That's not me. Okay. So since Sherry Ann repeated the song, I thought I'd repeat the sermon. <laughs> it was okay. Yeah, let's do it again, Sam. Play it again, Sam. <laughs> I, you know, actually, I was told. Okay, so this is how stupid seminary is. I don't know if you've ever been to seminary or not, but sorry. This is how stupid it is. They say when you start repeating sermons, you should look for another job. I, I mean, it makes sense, and, and kind of, sort of, if you ever find yourself, when, it, when it's time, when you start cycling, you need to cycle that somewhere else. So go get it. So, I don't know, maybe I'm nearing the end. I don't know. <laughs> joking, joking. It's not my ego you needed the boost. Uh, no, actually, but, I've, I've probably, we've used this verse in sermon, probably 2019, this will be the third time, Right? And, and so I get led to a thing I, I believe we should talk about, and then, and then the scripture verse that matches up with it, and, or the, the sermon series I'm, I'm reading or listening to my own, and decide, hey, that's where we want to jump in at. I'm just like, but it, it seems like we just did that. And, and I really had that struggle this week. I'm like, man, it seems like we just did that. Um, they're going to get bored, right? But then this is what I heard. Now, it could have been my own voice. I understand. This is what I heard. But they're, but you're not there yet. Like, even though you've heard it, you don't get it. And he was talking to me. I, I know that. He wasn't like, there's someone out there. Now, there probably is someone out there. But he told me, you ain't got it yet. So let's just keep doing it, right? So let's just keep talking about it. Let's look at it from a different angle, maybe, or a different presentation. So actually, you may not know this. Last week... We started a series, and it's called How Sweet the Sound, and it's about hymns and, and those that are written, those hymns that are written, and sort of the story behind them. Hymns, for those of you who've been at Beach Baptist most all your life, hymns are something people used to use to sing in church. <laughs> hymn books used to be in the seat pockets, right, of the pew in front of you. How many of you used to sit in a church and there was a hymn in the pew pocket? Oh, good. So, <laughs> present... Wasn't coming here. We think they're dumb. How many of y'all's was like pink? Anybody had one that was pink? Our church had pink hymnal Bibles. We did. We had pink. Our pews were pink, and someone along their intuitive mind said, let's get our hymnals to match. That was good. Is that good? Uh, anyway, we don't use those anymore. So last week's hymn we looked at was Amazing Grace, and it was Easter, so it was a good time to have the Amazing Grace Easter talk. Today, we're going to look at another hymn, and uh, we'll kind of get there because so there's there's that and then and then it, then it's prayer okay and it was really cool was this morning we, we talked at Amos 5 if you've never read Amos chapter 5 and then thought just how dumb you are as a religious person you need to read it again Amos 5 is talking to people who go to church but they don't follow Jesus there's a big difference a great big difference and that's kind of that's like my mantra. If somebody, when I die and on my tombstone, he, he wasn't religious. That may be the only thing they put on there. Um, because I grew up religious, and I, I, I've seen religion, and that's been my, my I butt heads with. Okay, I, I, just, I just do. So Amos 5 is really about people who knew who God was, but, and they follow a religious, only, but they only follow the religion. You, you can be a Christian and be religious. That's cool. I like that. But you, you can't be just religious. That doesn't work. That's what Amos 5 is talking about. So, um, I don't even know why I told you that. Prayer is kind of like that. 
prayer for the religious person is totally different than prayer for a follower, right? And I hope we can see that this morning. So that's the kind of perspective we're going to look at. Because I know right now that there's, there's some of you, there, you're, you're, you're probably going through something, right? You're, you may have a struggle. You might be the man on the ledge. You, you might know somebody who's the man on the ledge. Um, you might look behind you right now and or don't do that. <laughs> and you see somebody who's smiling or maybe they're in front of you and they're smiling, at least on the outside. But on the inside, it's just like one foot off the ledge. That's, that's common, that, and that, that's normal. Now, the, the difference, though, the difference is the relationship you have in that position. Because I'm here to tell you, you can be a Christian on the ledge. Matter of fact, Christians are usually the most on the ledge. Most non-Christians, they just jump. Non-Christian, or religious people, though, how they act on the ledge is a little, is a little different. And that's what we're going to look at. Um, so maybe you, you're there, you struggle, you've got something going on, there's a trial, there, whatever it is, very difficult, doesn't matter. Um, and, or maybe they're around, I'm gonna, we won't speak directly to that, right? And we want to see. So the, the, the song we're going to say, or the, the lyrics of the song says this, or the, the title is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I forgot to tell Mally we might need the words to What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So Jonathan, jump on there. Get to, everybody look at Jonathan and say, you got this. You notice they all left him? This, oh, she came back for him. Oh, they're back. Oh, yeah, you're in the shadows. It's okay. <laughs> but here's the first words of the song. We don't want them right now, but we'll, we, we're going to meet them at the end. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. So, okay, y'all all had a hymnal, but you didn't read the hymnal. I got it. Listen, I used to know, me and Wes were talking last night, I used to know the numbers to those, right? We never, we never said, turn in your book to what a friend we have in Jesus. We always said, turn your hymn to number 128, right, or 218, right? And we never sang the third verse. Third verse was Satan's verse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> if you sang the third verse of a hymn, the preacher had nothing to say that day, right? It was just like, okay, stretch it out, do all the verses, just do them all. Right there, oh, we're gonna go ahead and do it. That's good. But all the, everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit means give up. Oh, what needless pain we bear. I mean, we just we just bear it. Okay, remember, you're on a ledge. You forfeit the peace. You bear the pain. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Now I know it's a hymn. It's not theology, but it's pretty. It's pretty good. It's pretty close. He's got, some, he's got some good stuff in there. I mean, like, I wouldn't throw him out. I'd keep it. Instead, pray. So think about this. Don't worry about it. Jesus is what Jesus says. Don't worry about anything. This is Philippians 4, 6. I forgot to tell you. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. It's, it's, there's two different things. It's, you have an antidote. Oh, what peace we often forfeit because we worry. Oh, what needless pain we bear because we worry. Well, you can gain all that by praying about it. it. Doesn't fix it. But you forfeit peace and you bear pain because you do not pray. You forfeit peace and you bear pain because you do not pray. Promise. You need to write them down. You need to highlight those. Instead of highlighting, you get what you want when you ask for it. Don't highlight that one. Highlight, you bear, you bear pain and you forfeit peace when you don't pray. Hmm. Kind of puts it back on you, doesn't it? Doesn't that suck? I'd rather blame God. I'd rather just even take the blame. But there's hope, okay, because in this, when, when you read those verses of that song and when you start applying the biblical premise behind it, and then when you hear the story behind the guy that wrote it, which I'm going to tell you in a minute, you'll develop true and sincere love for the presence of God through prayer. The, hit, 
the, the present. You just, you just sang it. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Where'd that mean? Here at the church house? He already knew that. He lives here. This is God's house, remember? He built it, moved into the basement, lets us rent it. Is that what he really meant? Is that what, is that what you were meaning when you sang that song? Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this building. We promise to be good. Right. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Here's where you're welcome. Why are you welcome here? Because I'm tired of forfeiting peace. I'm tired of bearing pain. I welcome you to come in. Your your glory is what I long for. I'm 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 out here in no peace land and and pain land. I'm longing for your presence. I want to feel you. I don't want to just act like you want me to act. I, I want to feel you. I want to I experience you. And that's what the promise is for those who pray. Him. You, you get what you want. When you pray, if what you want is the presence of God in your life. To me, honestly, what I see and what I feel in my life is that prayer is a chore at best and ineffective at worst. Because of how I approach it, not not because of itself, not because of blame on God, but because of how I approach it and, and, and the manner in which I use it. I mean, when I look at my life, I know that when things are bad, I pray more. That's just, anybody else? Is it going to be real today? Okay, maybe not. It's okay. So I want to talk very specifically about prayer because I think we have some real misconceptions about it. And that we've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. But we still have misconceptions about it. Here's how I know, because just this week. Hey, would you pray for me? Why? Because I need this, this, and this. And they gave me three things that they needed. None of which was the presence of God in their life. None of it was peace about their circumstance. Or to unload some pain. It was just stuff. And things. And, 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 and a patch. And fix and, and this stuff. That's all they wanted. They just, they just pray for me that this happened. And I was nice. And I said, Bless your heart. <laughs> you haven't been to the coffee shop. Miss Debbie has really made some stuff for you. You really need to check it out. Bless your heart. <laughs> So that's how I know we just don't have it yet. We, it's just not there. We're still just wandering around about our life, and when it goes to hell, we call on God. That's when. We don't just experience His presence. We don't just talk to Him. So those are misconceptions, and that's what uh, I, I want to see us see. So first of all, here's what I think. Here's what I think is bad. People think prayer is complicated because I thought prayer was complicated. When I grew up, I thought you only had to pray to God sounding something like, O oh, God in heaven, we beseecheth thou to grant us with your presence now. In Jesus' name. Like you had a hairball right when you started to say Jesus. Like, I used to listen to people pray, it sounded like they had hairballs. Jesus. Or you sneeze right in the middle of Jesus. Zoom tight. But they make it very common. Like it's this, it's this, it was just like, whoa. But then, but then I got, I got, I got, I got enlightened, right? I became a true Christian. And then I found out that prayer is actually pretty legalistic. And whether I was taught or when I went to conferences and they would teach you how. You ever, you ever, you ever been taught how to pray? You know, like you're being done right now. <laughs> We're literally teaching you how to pray, and then I'm getting ready to make fun of somebody who teaches you how to pray. It's okay, because uh, I got the mic. 
They would say, um, let's see, the first one I had right. You have to pray early in the morning. It's kind of true, but incomplete. And then, they, then, then I was told, you need to pray for at least an hour. You've got 24 hours in your day. You don't think God's worth 1 24th? You know, a little bit of guilt there. I'm like, well, if you sleep, he's like, now, he's, now he's only worth 1 12th. So, pretty good. And then I was told, you really need to go into your prayer closet. Like, you need to have a space dedicated to prayer. So now I'm supposed to pray for an hour in the morning in a closet. Okay. And then they're like, okay, now here's how you start your prayer. You have to bind up the devil. Okay. So the first thing in your prayer closet in the morning, after, you don't even get to have coffee in this level, right? I mean, you have to sacrifice everything. Yeah, no coffee in the prayer closet. That's, that's a rule. But then you have to go in there and you have to bound, bind up the devil. So I spent, I, I spent a considerable amount of, amount of time trying to figure out how to bind up the devil. And, and then I was told, you just have to tell him. You just have to tell him he's bound. Well, that's easy. Doesn't sound right, but it's easy. Oh, no, no, you just have to say the words. But if you don't say the words, he doesn't get bound up. Devil, we bind you. You've taken away my power. How long do you stay bound up? An hour. <laughs> do you understand how stupid this starts to feel? I'm in my closet for an hour. In the morning, devil's bound up, and the stopwatch has started. Because I know he's loose in an hour. And then, I just, then, then, then it goes farther. And then it says, now you need to ask for specific things from Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. What if you ask the wrong one for the wrong thing? Are they like most married people? And they don't communicate? So if you ask the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's like, not my job. I mean, can you not just look over and go, oh, he was talking to you? <laughs> Evidently not. So you have to keep it very specific. There's certain things God can do. That's the weather and things like that, right? Uh, there's the things that Jesus can do, which is keep you in God's good graces, right? Don't make sure you tell him I didn't mean it, right? And then there's things the Holy Spirit does, which keeps your mouth in check, right? And, and, and keeps you on the, on, in good behavior down here. So everybody's got their own jobs, but you have to ask specifically. And my prayer closet got to be a really pain in my butt, to which I just said, And many of us are probably that way. If that's the way it has to look, if that's the way it has to feel, I'm just not going to do it. Because I would go out and it, then it got to the point where I'm like, do I have to kneel? Do I, do I need to cross my fingers like this? I mean, how many of you grew up? I'm just waiting to see if you're paying attention. You, hopefully you all grew up. <laughs> you grew up, but when you were growing up, your parents were like, bow your heads, close your eyes. How many of you have it grew up in church? <laughs> and then some well-meaning older Christian would go, you didn't have your eyes closed during the prayer. And when you're young, that's fine. You're scared to death. But as you get to be at 13, you're going like, how do you know? <laughs> and they were like, oh, we're checking. That's our job. We didn't have to pray right then. We're just watching for you. That's how it worked. That's how, that's how it you didn't take your hat off when you prayed. How do you know? And why do I have to? Disrespect. God doesn't listen to you if you're disrespectful. Well, he probably doesn't listen to me ever then. Because at heart, we're all disrespectful. Think about it. 
You've got these things applied to prayer that you don't, and the reason you don't do it, you may not even think about it. Because I would leave my prayer closet and things wouldn't change. Bless your heart. I would not get what I prayed for. And it became very complicated to me. Fred John. And then, to make matters worse, you go get with another group of people. Maybe it's a Sunday school class, a life group, whatever your thing is. Or maybe it's in, maybe it's in big church. And there's the professional prayer. Prayer. The guy who prays. And you, like, get saved every time they pray. I mean, you're just, like, listening to them going, how did that happen? I want to be that guy. I mean, I grew up in church, and people would get ready to ask on somebody to pray, and I'd be like, right? Or I was holding hands with him one time, and we're getting ready, and the guy goes, like, who would like to pray? And I'm, like, squeezing his hand. I'm like, Right? And it became sort of a competition to me, right? I, I wanted to be that guy. I, I wanted to develop a prayer that out loud people were like, awesome. <laughs> like, just got saved all over. But that's it. But they would also, then there's the guys that would pray. You ever met these guys? They would remind God what he wrote in the Bible. I love those guys. And Jesus, or no, you don't talk to Jesus about this part. Don't forget because he didn't write the book. God did. And God, you said in your word in Isaiah 54, 17, which is highlighted in the top right-hand corner of my Bible because you exposed that to me, that you would, uh, I could call on you. And, and then we see you, just God, as I call you Jehovah, that you're my banner. And you just speak. And you said that no weapon formed against me will prosper. Right? And, and they're just like scripture after scripture after scripture. And you're just like, I really need to read my Bible more. <laughs> so I wanted to do, I, you know, I do, I do that. And, and then you hear somebody who's trying to compete with that, right? And they say things like, uh, God, you are Jehovah Nisan. Your word's so good it melts in your mouth, not in your hand. <laughs> so I mean, they're like almost there. I mean, they're like. Like professional prayer in training, right? So they get, they get kind of close. You always want to swap them on the butt when they're over and go, good job, good try. You'll get there. Go at it again, right? Oh, God, you're like a good neighbor, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that, you know, that was it. People think it's complicated. Then, then the other thing people think about is prayer is boring. I'm in this camp. Because you know what I did for most of the time when I tried to pray for an hour in the morning? I went back to sleep. I did. And, and, and actually, I at night, if I'm having trouble falling asleep, you know what I do? I pray. It's a great sedative. Now, I do that, uh, in fair disclosure, I pay a woman a lot of money per week to tell me <laughs> that if you're having trouble getting your mind to shut down and you're having trouble falling asleep, you should pray. I'm like, okay. You're right. It's that boring sometimes. So, a lot of people won't do it because it just is just like, bleh. but but I get bored when I'm praying for an extended period of time, and I will I will think about things like, God, I, I pray for my my friend that my friend needs Jesus. Oh wait a minute, and I need cereal. <laughs> Alexa, order cereal. Whatever, and toilet paper, a route of toilet paper. You know, it's, it's just my, my ADD is so rampant that I get bored really, really quick. And I, and I, and I drop off the cliff. And, and so it's not effective. So if I'm, if I'm not going to see it through, I'm, I'm going to God, just, just don't do it. My wife says, if you're not going to do it right, don't do it at all. Right? Don't do things halfway. It's kind of where I was at. Because see, all those misconceptions say, if prayer works, why, would, why is grandma still sick? I mean, I remember praying for my, my grandmother. She was 80, I'm talking about, no, no, like 86 when she died. She had Alzheimer's. 
And I remember praying, don't let her die. <laughs> and now I look back, I'm like, how stupid is that? She's 86 years old. She's going to die. Like, why is grandma not healed? Because she's 86 years old. And I'm praying a certain way because that's how I feel. And, and I can pray that and I get bored with it and then I, I stop. Or I pray that and it doesn't seem effective. Or I pray that and it's really complicated because I think I'm not doing it right. And it just doesn't seem to fit everything I've got going on in my life. So I just kind of stop, right? And maybe I look at God and go, you know what? You're going to do whatever you want. I'm not going to waste my time. I got to that point in my life. It is what it is. Everybody's got that camp. God's going to do what God wants to do. Let's not bog him down with the crap going on in our life. Let's just let the chips fall where they may. And in essence, what we're getting ready to do is put all these attitudes together and say you were, we're, we're, we're kind of right. But then we're going to figure out the friend we have there. Because God is going to do what God wants to do. And, and I'm sorry to tell you, this is just me believe. But just because you go into your prayer closet and spend an hour with him every single day for six days, he doesn't just go, okay. Because you asked, we're going to do it that way. Listen, I, there's a lot of well-meaning Christians out there that say prayer changes things. And when I pray, things move and people are healed and this fixes. And Bless your heart times ten. Because you don't understand the God I serve. Because if he's up there waiting for you to give him instruction and to prove how faithful you are in your praying and then responding to that, honestly, I don't want anything to do with him. Because I don't trust you. I don't even trust me to come at to him with a pure heart for all of humanity, for all of what's going on. Like, there's no way I trust you, and there's no way I trust me. I can only trust him. Prayer does not change things. Prayer changes you. Absolutely every single time. So many misunderstandings of what prayer and what it does. We need to understand and embrace the truth that we're not praying, but we're not praying to this distant, unloving, unattentive, hard-to-please God. We're actually praying to a loving, caring, personal God that actually calls you and me friends. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a privilege we have to carry to him in prayer everything. And that's why he said, John 15, 15. I've, this is a different version, but this is, this is the essence of it. I've never called you servants. Because a master doesn't confide in his servants. Jesus said, but I call you my most, I think I give you this first, didn't I give you this first? I call you my most intimate friends. I don't call you servants. I call you friends. As a friend, we get to share the intimate moments of life. We get to do things together. That's what prayer life should look like between you and God. Whether you got to think it's God or whether you got to think it's Jesus or just the Holy Spirit. Whatever picture you use, doesn't matter. Same guy. Calls you friend. Imagine this. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The alpha and the omega. The first, the last, the beginning, the end. The great I am. The, the king of kings, lord of lords also calls you friend. Here's buddy. You're his pal. Whatever, whatever you got to do. No, you're not being irreverent, irreligious to think of him that closely. If, if, if you're just the minion down here and he's the almighty and you're appealing to his good graces, you got, you've got the relationship wrong. Because he's close. He literally says he's closer than a brother. Friend. Sometimes closer than brothers. That's who Jesus wants us to see him as. He was even accused by his haters who said he's a friend to sinners. 
You know, all those people out in the world who are sinning, he's friends of those too. No, he's a friend to you. Just like he's a friend to sinners. Because you're a sinner. He's a friend to the people who need him most. And that's everybody. Unless you don't think you need him. In which case, you're the one who needs him the most. Which then again makes him your friend. Think about that for just a moment. I just put you in a tailspin. The song. What a friend we have. It's written by a guy named Joseph Scriven. Joseph lived, I'm going to read this because I can't remember all this. Joseph lived in the 1800s in Ireland, but he fell madly in love with a female. You know, today's culture, I got to make sure you know. A true born female. <laughs> dig, dig. Dig, dig. Got it. <laughs> Head over heels in love. Childhood sweetheart, man. I mean, you're talking every love card ever made applies. I mean, he could send them for everything. Uh, and he heard it making mixtapes. I mean, he was just all over the place. Oh, and one day they were going to get married. The day before, they rode horseback uh, out to meet one another. Probably for a hookup. We're not going to lie, okay? They were out. I only got like four of you on that one. That's okay. You got it good. Tragically, but, but tragically, her horse, Buck, threw her off. She hit her head on a rock next to the river, rolled into the river, and died. And she had beaten Joseph there by about five minutes. And he rode up and found her floating face down in the river dead. The day before the wedding. Okay? I mean, that's what he gets for thinking they can go do things like that before they get married. I don't want you to laugh about that. I want you to think about how silly you are about things you think about. You know how sometimes people get what they deserve. Just think about it. He actually had that thought. What have I done? How did I tick off God? I could have done more. So this life falls apart. Has to leave Ireland because he just doesn't want to face everything he knew there. I mean, he was done. Moves to Canada, encounters Jesus. I mean, had the encounter. Went, moved from religion to full on, <laughs> I am sold out. I mean, fully, massively in love, living for Jesus. Defi decides that, that he's going to live his life out to the teachings of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Takes a vow of poverty, right? And, and, and is very, very handy, starts working for people. The only problem is he won't work for anybody who can afford to pay him. He only works for people who, who can't do it, who can't pay him. So he goes and does things for free, and that's how he lives his life. So he's living in complete poverty. Last week, remember, we talked about Amazing Grace. Who remembers the nickname of that guy, Joseph, uh, John? No. Yep, the great blasphemer. You're so good. You're like Hey, you, but you usually sit over here because you're kind of freaking me out. <laughs> you're not going to find God today because you moved chairs. <laughs> Was somebody sitting in your chair? We can kick them out. No. <laughs> I'm checking. I'm checking. Anybody ever been to a church like that? A little lady walks down the aisle and looks at you. <laughs> you must be new here. <laughs> And you're like, I am. It's so good to be here. Fine, but you can find another place to sit. <laughs> <laughs> My car. <laughs> I'm going to sit. <laughs> anyway, his name was Good Samaritan. Always helping people who need. Joseph Scriven. Good Samaritan, right? So this young lady sees this very godly man. Oh, and it takes interest in him. I mean, he's like, I can get behind a guy like that, man. It's just awesome to see somebody. Her name's Elijah Roach. Engaged to be married. Two weeks before they get married, she's 23, comes down with pneumonia, and dies. Hmm. Hmm. Kidding me? Two times, not once, but twice. Once as a religious guy, now as a Christian. Fiance's taken from him. Very young age. And you think, this guy, come on. So years go by, his mother's dying back in Ireland. He didn't have money to go see her because he's still living in vile poverty, so he writes her a poem and sends it to her. Well, this poem gets in 
gets into the, the funeral, and then they actually print it for the, you know, the funeral stuff. And it becomes very popular and becomes a song. Unauthor unknown. And one day this guy's in, his, in Joseph's house, and he, he finds this handwritten poem of that song. And he's like, why do you have that? I wrote that for my mom when she died. He's like, dude, you're a millionaire. <laughs> Joseph's like, no, what are you talking about? And he, and, he, and he finds out. He wrote the song. And the guy goes, you wrote this? He goes, well, not me. Me and God, right after Eliza. I mean, right, right, right when mom died. Me and God wrote that. That was just the words that came to me. Because as, as I looked at back at my life, and I thought, how? How did I get through that? How did I, how did I do that? And you remember, it was this friend I had. He was my confidant. And he, and, he, and he told the guy, he said, we were, we were talking one day. And the guy was like, what do you mean? I was like, I was just talking to him. I had this going on, this going on. I'm just talking to him. And that's what I felt. And I read that story and I'm like, he got it. He got it. That's what we're going to do. James 5, 16. He told us, to pray for each other so that we would be healed. The, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. In your life. You, you are healed when you pray. You're healed from pain. The one you're bearing that doesn't belong to you. You're, you're healed from no peace. You know, the one that you forfeited by not praying. You're healed by that. Th this effective, righteous person praying. <laughs> Man, remember we talked about prayer, Jabez, and <laughs> I thought that guy was a genius to sell it to a bunch of religious people. Because the prayer effective much. Your lands are excreased. No, it's not. Come on. Your influence is increased because you get off your butt. You don't. You don't try to just gain stuff. You try to give stuff. Your influence is pushed on because you talk to your friend. And he gives you advice and, and there's this thing, right? And it's effective. Your prayers comfort hurting people. It does. You praying for others affects others. It does, right? I'm not, I'm not saying it, the only person I don't think it affects is God himself. It affects you, and it affects others. How cool is it when somebody says, I'm praying for you? How awesome does that feel? It feels great. Because people take the time out of their life to quit talking about themselves for so long that they talk about me, or they talk about you for them, or that, and those, and this. How much better would we all be if everybody took some time and prayed for each other? Instead of just what I want. James said, pray for each other so you'll be healed. Because we are. We're not praying to this distant, unloving, un, un, uncaring God. Intimate. Friend. But you're going to pray for people and you're going to believe it works. You're going to pray. And I'm going to believe that I get peace in that relationship. And, and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to believe that you get peace. Just knowing that you're being prayed for. I'm not calling peace down. Thankfully, right? How bad would it be in your life if you were waiting for somebody else to call peace down for you? I'd have to be calling you all the time. Did you pray for the peace yet? Come on, come on I didn't get it. What, did you forget? Come on. Did, did, you, did you pray for my healing? It's not here yet. I'm, I'm waiting on you. You're my last hope. Everybody else I called on to pray, they suck. You're my last God. I, come on. Can't be that way. But I do believe it works. Because when I pray, and you know it, and you accept it, you get this peace, and you're like, yeah, you're right. There's God. I feel him. His presence is near me. It, it didn't get near me. 
You just realize it is near you. Always. That's cool. Because he calls you a friend. Now we got time. Here's how you get to pray. Now you want to get taught how to pray. So we how bad it is. Here's how good it is. First, just talk to him. Just talk to him. Paul in Philippians 4 talks about prayer in this beautiful, simple, intimate way. And if you understand, Paul thought he was going to Rome at this time. He thought he was going to go to Rome be a preacher. He goes to Rome, gets hitched up to a Roman guard 24-7. And that's what he's telling us to pray as this, or pray in this way. That's the context. He's a prisoner. I'm going to go there and preach instead of going to prison. Actually, possibly waiting execution. And here's what he says. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. This is the verse we have been doing over and over and over. Write this down. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. I mean, if it's this much of a concern in your life, then why are you not praying about it? Now, not in that stupid, religious, have you prayed about it? But in this intimate friend, instead of worry about it, pray about it. Cast it. Well, we're going to get there. I don't want to say that ahead of time. Tell God what he needs and thank him for all he's done. That's what Philippians 6 is all about. You just talk to him about it. I got this problem. I got this problem. And I want to thank you for everything you've done. And you just have this conversation in his back. I don't care if it's early in the morning. I don't care if it's an hour. I don't care if you're binding up the devil. None of that has to be. Paul comes along and says, this is my favorite one, pray without ceasing. Now I'm going to tell you right now, that, that's cumbersome. If, if, I got, now listen, I got really zealous about this. I understand. In my early days of preaching, I was like, listen, so don't, don't even pick out your clothes until you pray about it. Now, that's, that's fine and dandy unless you have ADD. You end up spending a lot of naked time in your closet. <laughs> because I go in there to pick out my clothes and end up talking to God about other stuff. And I'm holding myself to this. You haven't told me what to wear yet. That must mean wear nothing. <laughs> but it's getting cold. Right? And so I would get, I got pretty crazy about that. That's, I don't believe now that's what it means. I'm a lean, I, I mean, so here's what, I don't pray very long anymore. But I never go very long without praying. That, that's sort of my, that's sort of my new mantra. Yes, when I get up, I, I very wholly try to pray first. When I go to sleep, yes, because I fall asleep, I, I, I pray first, I pray last. And then along the way, along the day, it reminds me that he's there. That's what these little things of praying without ceasing mean now. I, I, I never forget that he's actually in my presence. I or I'm in his presence. I, I never forget that he's, that he's always that close. I, unless I don't. Unless I cease praying. Then when I cease praying, things go to hell. And I go, wow, what happened around here? What did y'all do? In reality, I ceased. Knowing that God was right with me. I became the man on the ledge. As parents, have you ever reached the end of your rope? <laughs> same thing, same thing, right? I was told one time, this is, pretty good, this is pretty good advice. If you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot, right? And let, let God be your knot. I don't know, you can make all kinds of bumper stickers, but same thing. You get there and you're like, why am I here? Why do I feel this way? I can tell you. I, I pay a woman a lot of money to tell me this. So I got really unnerved this week. Everything got on my nerves, right? I just felt edgy. And she was like, well, did you quit praying? I said, you suck. That's what I told her. Because that's it. You get outside of God's presence and everything gets on your nerves. You get outside of God's presence and you start to feel like you want to kill someone. You get outside of God's presence and everything, the weight of the world hits your shoulder. And you feel bogged down. 
you feel depressed. You feel those things. It is. It is. I have a son we sent to this same doctor, and she was talking to him. And <laughs> he's like, you know what? I'm not going back because everything she tells me is my fault for not being close to God. I'm like, Now, the tools, if you would just hang on, the tools to get you there is what's really important, but she just gave you the end of the story ahead of time. How's that? The answer to your life is to stay close to God. And when you're not, when, when your life feels like it's in an upheaval, get close to God. Use the thing to get back. Mm. It's crazy. It's ongoing. So just talk to me. That's, that's, that's like part, part the, the main thing. Just, just consistent bursts of communication. Like you're talking to a friend. Send him a text. I do know a pastor friend who has God in his phone. <laughs> I don't know where they go. Somebody told me if you Google it, God has a phone number on Gmail. You know one of those fake Google numbers? And you can actually talk to him via text. So you don't get this sorry wrong number thing. <laughs> it actually goes through. Uh, y'all Google that, see if but seriously, you could text, send him a text. I mean, it's sometimes better than sending the guy you really want to send the text to. Think about it, right? Just direct my steps today, God. You see somebody in hurt, God, give me the give me give me some words to share there. Help me communicate in the right way. Let me be better in this situation. God, if I start talking, it's going to be bad. Can you help me? Just, just pop those up there. He's listening. He's right. Memory's right there. It's not like you've got to go, I need everything to stop for a moment. I've got to talk to God. You know, and like heaven's like, oh, sorry. May we present the Father. It's just like he's already, he's always there. It's right now, right now, right now, right now. Bring him in. He's right here. And then sometimes, sometimes you, you need to vent to God. And this is going to be some freedom for some of y'all. Because some of y'all just aren't talking to God because you're mad at God. Some of y'all are not talking to God because you've got some things you need to say. Good news. 1 Peter 5, 7. Better word for what you've probably been saying. Cast all your anxiety on him. Cast it. The picture is, let him have it. Not, it's okay, God, you're my brother. Cast it. It is a forceful. It's almost angry. Anybody ever been mad at, you're not going to tell me. It's okay. Anybody want to be truthful? You've been mad at God. Okay, good. Good. Like, all the time? Oh, a very long time. Absolutely. Totally. And then, and that's cool. It's okay. Welcome to Beach Baptist. We give you permission to be mad at God. If you go to a church that says you can't be mad at God, switch churches. Because it's in fair play. God, this makes me mad. God, I don't understand. God, where are you? Because all those answers are there. Where are you? Right here. I mean, immediately. God, I feel like you've, you've, you've ignored my life, but I haven't. Just right then. God, I don't think you care, but I do. God, you're not listening to me. Eh, you're right. You're supposed to be listening to me. In the whole who knows more about life situation, you're way down here. Maybe because we know that, we don't necessarily vent to him so much. But it's okay. You're supposed to be able to vent it to him. You're supposed to be able to cast those anxieties upon him, those cares upon him. Just, just like your kids. So your kids come up and they're hurt or they're disappointed or they have a problem and they're, they're mad about it. You don't just say, go away until you got a better attitude. Now, if they're mad at you, you might do that. But you know there's a better way? Kids have these emotions, these feelings, they come up and they want to express them. You let them. 
I know parents who've taught their kids, don't be so angry. And they say it like that. you got to stop being so angry. And they point and they, you need a better attitude. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be bad if God responded to us like that? We're just coming, God, you don't understand. You need to go away when you understand what life's all about. You come talk to me when you can talk in a good voice. I'm glad he doesn't. But maybe, just maybe, some of you think that's how he does. And that's why you don't. Well, I'm just not going to talk to him yet. I've got I've to calm down. So you're forfeiting your peace. You're going to calm down. You're going to go find your peace, and then you're going to approach God. Even though the promise is, approach me however you are, and I'll give you peace. I'll take your pain. See how that works? He cares. Third, third, and this one's going to hurt if the other ones didn't. Shut up. Just, just shut up and listen. Just listen. We did a sermon four weeks ago, was it? Just hang out at the feet. Just, just. <whistles> Sometimes I, I picture, I, I know God doesn't do this, okay, so caveat. I picture God going, yig it. I do that to one of our kids every now and then because they're just like, I eat it. One second. Look, she just poked around the corner. She knows I'm talking to her. Nigga, or I'm going to kill you. Right? Because they're just like yammering on and about themselves. And that's kind of how we go to God. I mean, we just go on and on and on about ourselves and what's going on here. And sometimes, sometimes. Shh. There was a really great wise person who once said that's why God gave you two ears and one mouth so that you can listen twice as much as you talk what if we applied that to prayer well how can you pray and not talk if you understood what prayer is all about pretty easy it's a two-way communication and at some point you gotta shut your pie hole and hear God talk to you because he does I love the Christians who go, I can never hear from God. I know why. I, have you met you? <laughs> have you ever had to have a conversation? You know anybody who you could have a conversation with? Probably not. What if you were to be approached like Samuel said? Samuel said this, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. What if that could be you? Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Have you ever said that in your prayer life? Have you ever went to God and go, I, I need to go pray? I'm listening. And that was the extent of prayer. I doubt it. I know I haven't. But would it be, could it be so much better? Can you imagine what he could say? Well, is he going to call me by name? Is he going to go, son, you need to. I don't know. He might. He can. Probably not. But he could show you in so many ways. I mean, he could just like reveal. Wouldn't that be cool? He could. Guarantee. Guarantee. Now, I'll tell you, here's how you guarantee you can hear from God. And this is serious. I don't care if it's in the morning or not. Grab, grab something that you call Bible. I don't care if it's our app. I don't care if it's a Bible app. I don't care if it's your written book. Just grab something that's called the Bible and, 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 and absorb some. Right? Just, just, he speaks through that. And that's a guarantee. Okay? God always speaks through what he wrote down in the Bible. He does that. He always speaks in other ways, and sometimes those are confusing. But the Bible... A hundred percent of the time. If you're, it, I challenge me. I'll quit. I'll quit doing what I'm doing. 
if you will go this week and actively seek to hear from God by reading his word, so do it with a pure heart, not to get me to quit. Actively seek to hear from God with a pure heart, read his word, and if you don't hear from him, I'll quit. Now, I didn't say if you don't hear what you wanted to hear. If you don't hear from him, if you don't experience his presence by reading his word, then it's a lie, and I don't need to do this anymore anyway. That's how much I know that's true. If you're a non-Christian, be careful. Because he's got some surprises in store for you. If you're a Christian, be careful. You might have some stuff that he wants to really manipulate in your life. And it might, it might hurt. It might hurt. That's okay. How do we talk? We pray. He calls us friends. We just talk. We're hanging together. We're doing life together. God, I love you. Wow, man, you're showing off. That's a cool sunset out there. Man. Oh, good breeze. Look, look at that wind. You can't even, can't even see wind. There it is. That's awesome. That's so cool. Isn't that God? You know, the, just that kind of cool stuff. God, I'm confused. God, I'm hurting, man. This, uh, uh, man. All I did was turn around and got slapped in the face with news I don't like. I'm, wow, I don't like that. And wow, come on, God. I look over there, and I'm looking over here, and I, you're not, we're not having a good day today. And then sometimes you just, there, if you let me say what I needed to say, now speak. I'm listening. That's pretty cool. Hey, church, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell him what you need. Cast the cares upon him. Listen. You will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that you can understand. That's the rest of Philippians 4, 6. You're not going to understand why you feel it, but you're going to know how to get it. See, true peace is not found in the absence of problems. It's found in the presence of God. Just because this problem you have goes away doesn't mean you're going to experience peace. And some of us believe it does. But the presence of God is always there. And you will experience peace that way. Now, I, I had issues about why we were going to talk about this today. And then, I know, I know intimately many of you. And I know there's, there's things going on. So one of those things uh, Brenda is experiencing with her daughter. We got bad news about Brenda's daughter. She has cancer of the jaw. One of the rarest things you're ever going to hear about. And she's going in for a surgery. And I, I her name's Renee, and I, I, I text Renee and talk to Renee, and I'm like, hey, I'm here for you. Just reach out. Anything you need, right? So I, I put that out there. I'm like, whatever you need that I can do, I want to do. Now, I'm going to tell you what she said, and, and then we're going to do it. Um, <laughs> love on mom and dad. And remind them over and over, God has a plan. And he'll go before me. He'll carry me. And we will give him the glory. <laughs> See, I was expecting, just pray this goes away. Pray that when I go into the doctor, it's not even there anymore. Pray that I get in there and there's this miracle. Now, I got a text from somebody who understands what this is about. I got a text from somebody who says, God's right here. God's already in the middle of this. He's ahead of me. He's already out there. And, and mom and dad, they're going, they're going through it, too, with me. And, and what you can do, you can love on them. Okay, I can do that. So we're going to pray for Brenda and for Renee. And we're going to do it in a way that, that Brenda understands that you're right here. Loving on. I'm really going to make her mad at me because I'm going to make her come up here. 
and, and we're all going to gather like around her. But, but check this. We're not going to lay hands, okay, because that looks really religious. So we're not, we're going to, you can do it. We're going to gather and we're going to sing that song. Whoa. Because I think that's cooler. And we're going to remind her. There you go, John. He's a tissue giver at it. We're going to remind her. Here's your friend. Here's your friend. And you have that friend in Jesus and us. So if you don't know the song, Watermelon Works most of the way through the song but the words are going to be up here so now don't make brenda come by herself you you gaggle of ladies come with her and the rest of us we're going to come hang out right down here we're going to come down here to the cross because that's really cool and we're going to sing that song we may not sing it well but sherry ann can can you can you pick the note for us if not wes but that's going to be bad So put them up there and let's, um, how many verses did y'all download? All of them. We're, we're going to do it? No, we're not. We're going to do all four? Oh, yeah, let's do all four. So it doesn't matter whether you're facing this way, that way, or that way, they're everywhere. A friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. All oh, what makes we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because he did not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? their trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and cheer thee. Thou will find a solace there. Blessed Savior, thou hast promised. Thou Wilt all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to thee in earnest prayer. Soon in glory, bright, unclouded, there will be no need for prayer. 
rapture, praise, and endless worship will be our sweet portion there. And God, while we look forward to that, may we experience you here. In your name we pray. Amen.